Welcome back to this introductory statistical course. Today marks the second lecture of our series on the general linear model, and we'll be delving a little bit deeper into sums of squares, which in essence provide a way to describe how well your linear regression model describes your data. Last week we discussed the concept of linear regression. It describes the relationship between a predictor x and an outcome y as a diagonal line. And for each given individual value of the predictor x sub i, this line predicts a value y hat sub i. But that prediction will be a little bit wrong for every individual. By definition, the regression line is the line that gives the least prediction error on average across the whole sample. And that also means that the regression line is precisely in the middle of all of the data points. And that also means that the mean of the normally distributed error terms will be zero. But today we will learn what exactly it means that this line gives the least possible prediction error. Linear regression models are estimated using the ordinary least squares method. And this method minimizes the total prediction error. So what is this total prediction error? How can we define it? If we look at the prediction errors in this graph below, the error for each person is represented by a blue bar. So this is the distance of that person's observed score relative to their predicted score according to this linear regression model. To get the total prediction error, can we simply add the prediction errors for the 92 students in this plot? Well, no, there's a problem because the regression line by definition goes exactly through the middle of the data. That means that the sum of all prediction errors by definition is always exactly zero. And in this graph that's visualized, all of the positive prediction errors where the person's score was greater than their predicted score are indicated with blue bars and all of the negative prediction errors are indicated with red bars. And what we see is that the sum of the positive prediction errors is plus 36.25 and the sum of all of the negative prediction errors is minus 36.25. So if we just take the total sum of every student's prediction errors, then we would get a sum total of zero every time because the line is in the middle of the data. So the problem is that the positive errors are always exactly negated by the negative errors. And the solution to this problem is to get rid of the negatives by taking the square value of all of the prediction errors. Taking the square of values is a mathematically simple procedure to get rid of any negative values. And this allows us to take a sum of the squared errors, which will always result in a positive number. That in turn allows us to find the regression line that gives us the smallest sum of squared errors. So now we have a definition of what it means to minimize the prediction error. We find the coefficients a and b of the regression line that gives us the smallest sum of squared errors. And those parameter values also give us the line that gives us the smallest non-square errors. So squaring the errors doesn't affect the parameter values that we find. So how do we calculate the sum of squared prediction errors? We write the mathematical operation as follows. We use the summation operator indicated by capital sigma. That means that we're summing across some things. And what are we summing across? Well, we're summing across the differences between the observed scores for every individual minus the predicted scores for that individual squared. So what is summed here are simply the squared prediction errors for all individuals. And a result of that sum in this specific example is 84.18. So it's a positive number. Note that the sum of squared errors is only the first example of many sums of squares that you are likely to encounter. We're going to see other sums of squares whenever we're summing across things that could be both positive and negative. And the formula usually looks something like this. We see a summation operator. Then between parentheses, we see the difference between two things and we get the difference by subtracting one from the other. And then that difference is squared. So anytime you see a formula that looks like this, I want you to think that's a sum of squares. So as I explained previously, 
bivariate linear regression is estimated using the ordinary least squares method. And that is simply a matrix algebra procedure, which is very straightforward, but it's not part of this course. And this calculation gives us, by definition, the line with the smallest possible total squared prediction error. This calculation gives us, by definition, the line with the smallest possible total prediction error. And prediction error here is defined as the sum of squared errors. That's where the name ordinary least squares come from. Least squares means the smallest sum of squared errors. So by definition, the regression line is the line that best describes the data. So a question that may arise is, how well does this line actually describe the data in objective terms? In a way, we could say that the sum of squared errors describes the goodness of fit. If the sum of square prediction errors is small, that implies that our regression line describes the data well, so that it has good fit to the data. But the problem is that the sum of squared errors is not on any meaningful scale, so we can't readily interpret what a specific value for the sum of squared errors means. And the solution is that we compare the sum of squared errors to some baseline in order to put it on a meaningful scale. And that baseline is the null model, which I already briefly introduced last week. To determine the goodness of fit of our regression line, we compare its sum of squared errors to the sum of squares we would obtain if we did not use information from the predictor to predict our outcome. So recall from previous lecture that if we did not include hours studied as a predictor of grade obtained, then we would just predict the mean value of grade for every individual. This is called a null model, as it has no predictors. And I want you to notice two interesting things about this. First of all, this model only has one coefficient, the intercept a. And this coefficient is just the mean of the outcome variable y. And if we then turn our attention to the prediction errors, we're still assuming that those prediction errors are normally distributed with a mean of zero, so they're distributed around the mean, which is now subsumed by this intercept a. And their standard deviation is just the standard deviation of the outcome variable y. So basically, this null model just describes the mean and the standard deviation of the outcome variable. So again, if we use the null model, we would just predict the mean value of the outcome variable, in this case grade, for every individual. And we can write that mean value as y bar. And this symbol here on top, that's called bar. We can also calculate a sum of squares around that mean value. And the sum of the square distances between the mean value and all individual observations is called the total sum of squares, or TSS for short. Now here, again, we see a formula that looks like a sum of squares, but this time we're calculating square distances between two different quantities. We're calculating the square distances between individual observations, y sub i, and the mean, y bar. And this little sub i should not be here. So it's just the difference between y sub i and y bar squared. In this particular data set, that sum of squares has the value 255.82. And that's bigger than the regression sum of squares, which was 84.18. In general, the total sum of squares is the largest possible sum of squares that we can get for this data set. And the sum of squared errors will always be smaller than that. Notice that this total sum of squares has a relationship to the variance of the outcome variable. In fact, you've seen the formula for the total sum of squares before. We used it to calculate the variance in lecture 1. So the variance of variable y, indicated as s squared of y, is given by taking the total sum of squares and dividing it by the sample size minus 1. In other words, the variance of y is just the average square distance of individual observations to the mean of y. So it's the average of the squared values of these blue bars in this graphic. Now that we know the error sum of squares, which is the sum of square distances between individual observations and the regression line, and we know the total sum of squares, which is the sum of square distances of individual observations relative to the mean, 
we can calculate what is called regression sum of squares. And the regression sum of squares simply tells us how large is the difference between the total sum of squares and the sum of squared errors. In other words, how much of the total sum of squares is explained away by using the regression line to predict values instead of using the mean line. So the reduction in sum of squares that occurs by using the regression line to predict observations instead of just the mean is called the regression sum of squares, abbreviated as RSS. In a formula that looks like this, the sum of individual predicted values of y minus the mean value of y squared. So it follows that we can calculate the regression sum of squares by subtracting the error sum of squares from the total sum of squares. So in this particular example, the total sum of squares was 255.82, and the error sum of squares was 84.18, and if we subtract those, we can conclude that the sum of squares explained by the regression line is 171.64. Let's have a look at a demonstration of this principle. So here we see our regression equation with on the x-axis the number of hours studied per week and on the y-axis the grade obtained. And we see several cases from our data set. So in this case, the red bars represent the sum of squared distances between individual observations and the regression line. And if we square all those distances and sum them, we get the sum of squared errors. And its value is 84.18. We can also look at the total sum of squares, and that is the sum of the square differences of individual observations relative to the horizontal line of the mean, and its value is 255.82 for this data set. And you also immediately see that the sum of squared errors is smaller than the total sum of squares. How much smaller? Well, the difference between the two is the regression sum of squares, indicated by the green bars here, and that is the difference for every observation between the predicted value according to the regression line and the predicted value according to the mean. And its total value, and its total value in this example is 171.62. So let's sum up what we've learned until now. You've learned about three sums of squares, the sum of squared errors, the total sum of squares, and the regression sum of squares, or sum of squares regression. Each of those has a different formula. The sum of squared errors is calculated of the sum of squared differences between individual observed values and individual predicted values. The total sum of squares is given by the sum of the squared differences between individual observed values and the mean. And the regression sum of squares is given by the sum of squared differences between individual predicted values and the mean. But if we know two of these quantities, we can always calculate the third. For example, the error sum of squares is equal to the total sum of squares minus the sum of squares regression. The total sum of squares is equal to the sum of the regression sum of squares plus the error sum of squares. And the regression sum of squares is given by taking the total sum of squares and subtracting the error sum of squares. The next topic I want to introduce is explained variance. It is basically a way to standardize the regression sum of squares. This relates to the question of model fit. What do we do if we want to describe how well our regression model describes the data? Can we simply report the regression sum of squares? Well, not really. There is a problem. Because sums of squares are difficult to interpret and they cannot just be straightforwardly compared from one data set to another. If you add even just one participant, that increases the sum of squares, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the fit of the model is worse. So in order to make the regression sum of squares interpretable, the solution is that we have to standardize it in some way. This standardization procedure is called explained variance. It answers the question, which portion of the total sum of squares is explained by the regression line? or the regression sum of squares. So to get the explained variance, we just calculate a ratio of the regression sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. And this gives us a statistic called R squared. And R squared is also called the proportion of explained variance or the coefficient of determination. 
it has a value that ranges between 0, which means that none of the total sum of squares is explained by the regression line, and we get a value close to 0 if this number is very small, and it has a value of 1 if 100% of the total sum of squares is explained by the regression sum of squares. So we get a value of 1 if this value becomes equal to the total sum of squares. So what about our running example? Which proportion of the total variance in the dependent variable is explained by the predictor? Well, we obtained a regression sum of squares of 171.64 and a total sum of squares of 255.82. So if we divide the one by the other, we get an R squared of 0.67. And we can simply interpret this as 67% of the variance in grade is explained by hours studied. Can we also perform hypothesis tests about how well the model fits? Why, well, yes we can. We may want to answer the question whether our regression model explains significantly more variance than the null model. Remember that the regression model has the form y sub i is equal to the intercept a plus the slope b times predictor x sub i plus prediction error epsilon sub i. And the null model just omits the effect of predictor x. So the null model is y sub i equals the intercept a plus prediction error epsilon sub i where the intercept a is just going to be the mean of variable y. We follow these steps for testing. Step one, we formulate hypotheses. Our default null hypothesis is that the model explains no variance. In other words, r squared is equal to zero. And we could use the Greek letter rho here instead of the r. The implicit alternative hypothesis here, h sub a, is that r squared is bigger than zero. Note that r square can only take positive values. It ranges from 0 to 1. So we don't perform a two-sided test here. We can only perform a one-sided test. That means that we also need a probability distribution that only takes positive values. So we can neither use the z distribution nor the t distribution. So what test statistic are we going to calculate in step 2? Well, let me introduce you to the F distribution. The F distribution ranges from 0 to plus infinity, so it never takes negative values, and we reject the null hypothesis if the F value exceeds some critical F value. In essence, the F test is just a ratio of two sources of variance. If we're performing a hypothesis test about the R squared, that ratio of sources of variance is the variance of the regression line divided by the error variance. So how do we get the variance explained by the regression line? Well, it is calculated as the mean square of the regression. And the mean square of the regression is just the sum of squares for the regression line divided by the number of degrees of freedom for the regression line. Similarly, we can calculate a mean square for the error and it is given by taking the sum of squared errors and dividing them by their respective degrees of freedom. So, of course, this raises the question, what are these two degrees of freedom? So the regression model has a number of degrees of freedom equal to its number of parameters minus one. So for bivariate linear regression, one outcome, one predictor, we have two parameters, A and B, so the degrees of freedom for the regression line are 2 minus 1. So we have 1 degree of freedom. And for the error terms, the degrees of freedom are given by the number of participants minus the number of parameters. So if we had 92 participants and we have two parameters, then the error degrees of freedom are 90. So how do we report these results? Well, for example, we could report that the regression model explains significant variance in the outcome with an R squared of 0.67, an F value with 1,90 degrees of freedom, and the first degrees of freedom is for the numerator and the second degrees of freedom is for the denominator. So this is the numerator degrees of freedom and this is the denominator degrees of freedom. And then we report the actual F value, which was in this case 183.51 and the corresponding p-value, which was smaller than 0.001. So how do you get this p-value? Well, you could look it up in a table. 
or you could calculate it with the help of a spreadsheet or with the help of an online R calculator, whatever you want. And then we give a straightforward interpretation of this result. Specifically, this means that our study explained 67%, that's 0.67 times 100% of the variance in exam grades. So a very high percentage of variance. The second major topic we'll cover today is bivariate linear correlation analysis. Although it's a little controversial, there's a good reason why I introduced this topic today. Because once you already grasp the basics of bivariate linear regression analysis and sums of squares, correlation is easy to understand. Correlation is a simple measure of how strongly two continuous variables are associated with one another. Consider two variables, x and y and they may be associated. If you have a higher value on x, then you tend to have a higher value on y, and if you tend to have a lower value on x, you tend to have a lower value of y. If you consider one of these two variables to be an outcome of the other, then regression is the correct technique to represent that association. And the R square of that regression model indicates how strongly they are associated. But what if you are not comfortable labeling one of them the outcome and the other the predictor? What if you just want to know how strongly these two variables are associated without making any statements about causal direction? Well, in that case, you can use correlation. Correlation is a standardized measure of the strength of linear association. And standardized here means that its range is limited to minus 1 up until plus 1. In a sample, we use the Roman letter R to indicate the correlation. And in the population, we use the Greek letter Rho to indicate the correlation. We interpret it as follows. A correlation of R equals minus 1 is a perfect negative association. A correlation of R equals 0 means that the two variables are completely independent. In other words, there is no association between them. And a correlation of 1 is a perfect positive association. Now, like I said, it makes sense to explain correlation after regression because correlation and regression are very closely related. In fact, I've just introduced you to R square, a measure of explained variance, and the R square for two variables is literally R squared. In other words, the squared correlation coefficient. So for my two variables, our studied and grade received, the correlation coefficient is the square root of this value for r squared, which I don't know off the top of my head, but I can easily calculate. So the correlation between these two variables is about 0.82. And if we square that, we get the r squared again. It's important to note that r squared is only the squared correlation coefficient when you're doing bivariate regression and correlation. The story is a bit more complex when we do regression with more than one predictor, but that's something you're going to learn about in coming weeks. This interactive application demonstrates the correlation coefficient, and we can manipulate the intercept A and the slope B and the standard deviation of the outcome and the sample size. So what we see here is that there is a linear regression model and a correlation coefficient. And if we increase the intercept, nothing changes about the correlation coefficient. And if we decrease the intercept, again, nothing changes about the correlation coefficient. What about if we increase the sample size? Well, we get a more accurate estimate of the correlation coefficient. So if, let's say we take a sample of a thousand participants, then we get a very accurate estimate of the correlation coefficient. It's about 0.45 in this case. But what happens if we change the regression slope? Well, then the correlation coefficient increases. And if we decrease the slope, then our correlation even goes to zero. So in this case, our regression line is completely horizontal, so it's identical to the mean line, so there's no correlation. And we also see that visually because the scatter plot looks just like a dot cloud. But the steeper the regression slope is, the stronger the correlation coefficient. Right? So going from a regression slope of 0, which corresponded to a correlation of 0, to a regression slope of 2, which corresponds to a correlation of 
There's a huge difference. And if we have a negative regression slope, we also get a negative correlation coefficient. But what happens if we decrease the standard deviation? Well, in that case, our correlation coefficient also goes up. In this case, our standard deviation is zero, so there is no residual variance around the regression line, and that gives us a perfect correlation. But if we have a very large standard deviation, in this case 10, then we get a very small correlation coefficient. So we see that the correlation coefficient is affected both by the steepness of the regression line and by the size of the residual standard deviation around that regression line. So to summarize what I just showed with this interactive app, we can imagine different scenarios. We could imagine a perfect positive correlation, and in a case of perfect positive correlation, all of the individual observations lie on the regression line and the regression line goes upwards. In a case of moderate positive correlation, the regression line goes upwards and the individual observations are kind of tightly packed around that upward line. In the case of a very weak or near zero correlation, the regression line is almost horizontal. In this case, it still goes slightly upwards and all of the individual observations are loosely packed around it. If the correlation coefficient is zero, the regression line is horizontal and corresponds more or less with the line of the mean. And the individual observations form a random dot cloud around that line. And in this case, we have a quite strong negative correlation. So the line goes downward and observations are packed tightly around it. And a perfect negative correlation means that the line goes downward and every individual observation is exactly on that downward line. But be careful, I'm going to bring back this Anscombe Quartet from last lecture, when we looked at it in the context of violations of assumptions. But now I want to bring up the Anscombe Quartet because all of the pictures in this quartet have a correlation of 0.70. But only in the top left picture is there a linear relationship between x and y. Now recall that the correlation is a measure of the strength of linear association. That means that it assumes that the association is in fact linear. In this second example, we see perfect association, but it is non-linear. So actually the assumption of linearity is violated. And if we could describe these data with a curved model, we would get a perfect association. But with correlation, we just get a value of 0.70. In this case, there is perfect linear association, but with a single outlier. So if we had removed this outlier, we would get a correlation of one for all the remaining values. And in this case, there is no correlation, but there is a single outlier that causes it to appear as if there is a correlation of 0.70. So if we were to omit this outlier, we would just get a horizontal regression line and a correlation of zero. So be very careful before interpreting the correlation and typically it's recommended to ask for a scatter plot of your data to visually inspect whether this assumption of linearity is met. For this course you don't have to calculate correlations but it can be instructive to look at an example of how the correlation is calculated to help you understand what it means. If you calculate the correlation by hand you go through several steps. Let's say we have two variables x and y. These are the values of six individuals on x and y. The first step is that we calculate the mean value of both variables. So the mean of x is given by taking the sum of all the individual values and dividing that by the number of individual values. So in this case for x it's 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 5 plus 7 divided by six observations. So the mean of x is 4 and if we perform the same calculation for y the sum of individual values of y divided by the total number of values, we get a mean of 5. The second step is that we calculate the deviations from the mean for both of these variables independently. So this column in the table contains the difference between the individual value of x minus the mean of x. So this person scored a value of 1 and their mean was 4, so the deviation is minus 3 for that person. And we could do the same for y. 
So for example, this person scored 3 on y, and the mean value of y is 5, so for that person the deviation is minus 2. The third step is to square these deviations to get rid of negative values. So these columns contain the squared deviations on the x variable and the squared deviations on the y variable. Verify that this is correct. For example, minus 5 squared is plus 25. Yeah, that's correct. This allows us to calculate the total sum of squares and the variance and the standard deviations for those variables. For example, the total sum of squares, for example, the total sum of squares for the x variable is just the sum of this column of squared deviations. In this case, the total sum of squares for x is 24. The variance is the mean of that total sum of squares. So we just divide the total sum of squares for x by the number of observations minus 1. We had 6 observations, so 6 minus 1 is 5. If we divide 24 by 5, we get the variance, which is 4.8. So the variance of x is 4.8. And recall that we can get the standard deviation, s or sd, by taking the square root of the variance, and the square root of 4.8 is 2.2. I don't know why that square root symbol is still there. That should not be there. The final step is that we calculate what's called the covariance. And a covariance is a rough, unstandardized measure of association between two variables. It is somewhat comparable to the sums of squares, although technically the covariance is a sum of products, not a sum of squares. How do we get the covariance? Well, we get the covariance by creating a new column in this table and in that column, we multiply the deviation from the x variable with the deviation from the y variable. So you immediately see that if you have big deviations on both variables, and they both have the same sign, so in this case they're both negative, then the product of those two things is going to be a big positive number. Similarly, if you score high and positive on your deviations from both x and y, then this column is also going to give a high positive number. In other words, if low scores on x tend to go hand in hand with low scores on y, then this column will get many positive numbers, and if high scores on x tend to go hand in hand with high scores on y, again this column will show many positive numbers. And if the deviation of x is unrelated to the deviation of y, then we're going to get a mix of positive, negative, and near-zero numbers in this column. If we then just sum this column across all participants, then we get the covariance. So in this case, the covariance is going to be a big positive number because we have a large positive number here and a large positive number here. This person had zero, this person had minus three, that's compensated by this positive number and this positive number. So for these two variables, we get a positive and large value for the covariance. The final step is that we can standardize that covariance in one of two different ways. One way is to take the covariance and divide it by the standard deviation of x multiplied by the standard deviation of y. That gives us the correlation coefficient r. But another way to standardize the covariance is to divide it by the variance of x, which is the same as dividing it by the standard deviation of x multiplied by the standard deviation of x. Very similar formula to what we did to get the correlation coefficient. So what I want you to realize here is that the correlation and the regression coefficient are both different ways to standardize this raw measure of association between two variables, which is called the covariance. They're both different ways to standardize the covariance. The correlation standardizes the covariance by the units of x and of y, and the regression coefficient only standardizes the covariance by the units of x, so that it will be expressed in units of y. If we go one step up in x, then we go b steps up in y. So even though this is a bit of a detour and you don't have to calculate this by hand for this course, hopefully seeing this calculated one time helps you understand that the correlation coefficient and the bivariate regression coefficient are very similar indeed. So to sum up, 
the correlation is standardized with respect to both x and y, and that means that the correlation is a symmetrical measure of association. So the correlation of x with y is exactly the same as the correlation of y with x. But the regression coefficient is only standardized with respect to x. That means that it's asymmetrical. The regression slope of x on y has a different value from the regression slope of y on x. And that's also why the units of the regression coefficients are in y. So we can say that a one-step increase in x leads to a b-steps increase in y. To conclude today's lecture, we'll devote a little bit of attention to the standardized regression coefficient. And again, there's a reason why I explained this to you after introducing bivariate linear correlation analysis, because the two concepts are closely associated and it will be easier for you to understand what the standardized regression coefficient is after already learning about correlation. Remember that the correlation coefficient is standardized by dropping the units of both variables, and actually the standardized regression coefficient does the same. A result of this is that in bivariate linear regression, the standardized regression coefficient is the same as the correlation coefficient. But this changes when we have more than one predictors, and that is a topic of a future lesson. So how do we calculate the standardized regression coefficient? Well, we simply calculate standardized z-scores for the predictor and the outcome. So for the predictor, we calculate the standardized score as the individual observations of x minus the mean of x divided by the standard deviation of x. And for the y variable, we calculate z-scores by taking the individual values of y minus the mean of y and dividing by the standard deviation of y. And a property of these z-scores is that they both have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And to get the standardized regression coefficient, we simply perform regression analysis with those z-scores. So let's look at this random SPSS output and interpret a few things. First of all, you learned today that the r-squared is a measure of explained variance. So in this case, 2.7% of the outcome is explained by the predictor. You also learned that the r-square is literally the correlation coefficient r squared, and indeed if we take the square root of 0.027, we get the correlation coefficient reported here. I also just explained to you that the standardized regression coefficient in bivariate linear regression is going to be the same as the correlation coefficient, and if we look in the column here of standardized regression coefficient, indeed we see that the standardized regression coefficient is the same as the correlation coefficient r. So that's how it all hangs together. There are several other things to notice about this output. These are basically the most important three tables if we perform a regression analysis in SPSS. So I've just explained what's important from the model summary table, specifically the explained variance or r square, and we can also find the correlation coefficient there. The ANOVA table gives us an f-test for the significance of this explained variance. Recall that the f-value is a ratio of the mean square for the regression divided by the mean square for the residual, and indeed if we divide 37 by 1 point something something, we get 35.99. And this mean square is obtained by taking the sum of squares for the regression and dividing it by the degrees of freedom for the regression, and indeed 37 divided by 1 is 37. And the mean squared for the error is obtained by taking the sum of squares for the error and dividing that by its degrees of freedom. And indeed, if we divide 1,332 by 1,293, we get a value close to 1, and this is the total sum of squares around the mean of the dependent variable. We've already seen the coefficients table last week. It shows you the intercept for this regression equation and its standard error. And if you divide the intercept by its standard error, you get the t-statistic. Now this t-statistic is very small. It's nowhere near our critical t-value for rejecting a zero-null hypothesis. And indeed, we see that its p-value is very large. And then here we see the regression slope for the effect of the predictor it is 0.17, and this is its standard error. If we divide the regression coefficient 
by its standard error, we get the t-statistic. We can use this to perform a zero null hypothesis test, and then we get a t-statistic of 5.99. That is going to be much larger than any critical t-value, and indeed we see that our p-value is much smaller than 0 0.001. And finally, I've just introduced you to this standardized regression coefficient beta, which for bivariate linear regression is the same as the correlation coefficient. That's all the material we'll cover today. I hope you get a sense of the peacefulness and beauty of the Pacific Northwest, even remotely by watching this video. I hope this lecture was insightful for you. Good luck in the tutorials, and I'll see you next week.